Hey guys, so in this video, we're going to be covering the ultimate guide to investing in the stock market as well as investing in real estate in your 30s. So I highly recommend watching from beginning to end. We're going to be covering benchmarking yourself to where you should be at at 30 years old, index fund investing, and how you can still become a millionaire in your 30s with the right approach. And we're also going to talk about retirement investing, among other things. Lastly, I do want to mention that there is nothing to click here. There is no sponsor, no pitch, no affiliate. This is what I call 100% straight value. So let's dive right in. The first thing we need to cover here is where should you be at in your 30s in terms of your money saved and invested for the long term. Over here, looking at CNBC, they provide a couple of estimates, and this will help us figure out whether or not you're on track with things or potentially need to play some catch up. Because odds are you did one of two things in your 20s. You either set yourself up for the years ahead by investing and putting money aside, and now you're sitting on some assets, or maybe you had a lot of fun and had some cool experiences, and now you're realizing, oh crap, I don't have any assets. Well, either way, in your 30s, you still have enough time to figure things out and even become a millionaire without a huge amount of money invested. But this is literally the point at which you can figure things out and have an easy time with it, or if you don't and you blow your 30s and you have nothing saved or invested by the end of your 30s, at that point, it becomes a lot more difficult to build wealth. The recommendation by 30 is your annual salary saved up. So if you made 55,000 per year by your 30th birthday, you would ideally have $55,000. So if you're in your 30s right now and you don't have your salary saved up and invested across your different accounts, unfortunately, you're behind where you should be based on this figure. Now, where should you be at by the end of your 30s? Well, by age 40, it's recommended to have triple your income saved up and invested. And it mentions down below the above savings guideline includes anything you have in a retirement account, like a four 401k or Roth IRA, as well as your personal investments you may have in index funds. So that's exactly what we were talking about here is your investments that you have and you could potentially include your cash in the bank if you do have that emergency fund. So this should give you an idea of whether or not you're on track or not. Now let's talk about what you should be doing in your 30s to make sure that you meet this goal of having triple your income saved up and invested by the age of 40. Now, in order to save up for something like a house or even setting aside money for an emergency fund, you're going to need to set up different savings buckets separate from your primary checking account, for example. And one of the best options for this is the high yield savings account. This is going to outpace inflation. You can get a competitive rate. For example, this here is CIT Bank. They currently pay 5.05% APY on balances above 5,000. Now we know inflation is around 3%, so you're safely outpacing inflation and you can tuck your money into a high yield savings account, outpacing inflation and allowing you to grow your money. Now you're going to want to automate all of this in terms of setting aside money for your retirement, which you might be doing that through your 401k. We're gonna talk about that later. You're also going to want to automatically invest into either a Roth IRA or traditional brokerage account, depending on how long out your time horizon is for your investment goals. And in addition to that, you're also going to want to automatically contribute to a high yield savings account. That way you can build up an emergency fund if you don't have one, as well as save up enough for a down payment on a piece of real estate. Now, starting off with the emergency fund, you're gonna to wanna to have about six months of all expenses expenses sitting liquid in a separate account. Let's say, for example, you spend $3,000 a month, you'd want to have 18,000 sitting there in your emergency fund in cash that you do not touch. Set the goal of saving up an emergency fund and then setting up a separate account or bucket for your real estate investment and aim to save up 50 to $100,000 in that account in order to get involved with a conventional loan, for example. Now, real quick, I do want to tell you about the FHA loan, even though it's not a great option in this current interest rate environment, when rates do come down, this could be a great option to be aware of. 
In my case, with my first real estate investment, I took advantage of this FHA loan, and this is a very low down payment loan, as low as 3.5%, and you can use this to buy a one to four unit property. Now, you wouldn't want to do something like this during a interest rate environment like we're in now because you're going to have a very big mortgage as you have very little skin in the game. And then you're also going to be paying for PMI, which is an insurance that the bank forces you to have. But I did want to mention this because if you are stressed out or demotivated about saving up 50 to 100,000, Keep this in the back of your mind for a low interest rate environment, but I wouldn't recommend this on single family. I would really only do this for a multifamily two to four unit property because then you have rental income offsetting some of that mortgage. We've covered the real estate side of things now, so you have an idea of what you need to have saved up in order to get into the real estate game. Or perhaps in your 20s, you put your head to the ground and worked hard and got into real estate in your 20s, and maybe now in your 30s, you're looking to build wealth more passively. Now we're gonna talk about the stock market, and we're looking at a compound interest calculator, and we're going to figure out the amount that you would need to invest in your 30s to become a millionaire in a reasonable amount of time time in the window of time that you might want to retire, for example. We're going to assume that you're starting off with an investment here of zero dollars and you're going to be contributing five hundred dollars per month. The thing with investing for the long term is you need to have a long runway of time if you want to have small contributions. Every year that you wait to begin investing, you're going to have to ramp up your monthly contribution in order to play catch up. For example, I did a video about how to invest as a teenager, and we looked at an example of how 50 bucks a month could turn you into a millionaire because of how many years you have. In your 30s, you still have a decent amount of time, but you need to ramp up your contribution. So $500 a month, if you have no money right now invested, you should probably aim to get to a level of contribution around that figure. Now, as far as the interest rate, it depends on the investment. And we're gonna look at the Warren Buffett approach here, which is investing in a low fee, broad market index fund. You're definitely not going to become a millionaire by picking stocks in the stock market. And just to prove that, Warren Buffett placed this bet years ago against hedge funds, claiming that the S&P 500 or the largest 500 publicly traded US companies would outperform or beat their active portfolio of five hedge funds. Now, hedge funds are professional stock pickers. They've gone to school for many years and they have a lot of experience with this type of thing, not to mention they have access to trading platforms, technology, et cetera, that retail traders just simply do not have access to. But nonetheless, the outcome here after 10 years was that the S&P 500 had a return of 125.8%. Meanwhile, the portfolio of the five hedge funds returned just 36.3% net of or after fees. The outcome here was that the passive strategy of just owning the broad market, what Warren Buffett recommends, blew the active strategy out of the water. This right here shows a heat map of the S&P 500. So if you're curious about what that actually looks like, it's a little piece of all of these publicly traded US companies. One of the interesting things here about this is this is a market value weighted index. And that means that the size or market cap market value of a company is going to influence the amount of weight that it carries in the portfolio. What that means is when you're investing in the S&P 500 through a Vanguard index fund, for example, more of your money is flowing into the larger companies and less of your money is flowing into the smaller companies. So companies like Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Google, Amazon, Tesla are receiving a lot of the money that goes into that fund based on how large they are. And then smaller companies are receiving a proportionally smaller amount. The top category here, for example, technology is called a sector, and that's just a segment of the broad economy. And then within that, you have particular industries like software infrastructure, semiconductors, consumer electronics, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just ways that segments of the economy are broken down into more granular um, departments, if you will. Many people think the S&P 500 is a boring investment, but it's definitely not boring when you think about all of the money going into Apple, Microsoft, and these other tech giants that are leading today's economy.
But what we need for our calculation here is the average annualized return of the S&P 500. So for that, we're going to jump over to Investopedia. Based on their information here, the S&P 500 has had an average annualized return of 11.88% since its 1957 inception. We're going to use that figure for our calculation. And then for the length of time, we're going to start off looking at one decade, projecting out 10 years into the future and seeing what your portfolio would look like. Based on that, you would already have $100,000 saved up. That's the benefit of ramping up your contributions. Although it might be a little bit uncomfortable, you will be able to get to your goal of having a large amount of money saved up and invested much quicker. In terms of the dollar amount invested, your total contributions here are $60,000 or $6,000 a year over 10 years, and you've made about $45,000 just under that in terms of market gains. So that's definitely a good amount to have saved up there, six figures, but you wouldn't quite be at that recommended amount of having triple your income unless you made a very small amount of income. But let's now take a look at the 20 year mark, projecting out another 10 years and seeing where this portfolio is at. At the 20 year mark, things have gotten really exciting. You now have $426,000. Let's assume then you started at age 30 and even if you had nothing saved or invested, you could still get to about half a million dollars by the age of 50 with a decent amount of money contributed per month. Maybe you will have to go without having a car payment, for example, or maybe you don't pursue a vacation as often in order to make that contribution, but these things may be worth it in order to build up significant wealth for the long term. But let's say, for example, that you want to become a millionaire. We're now going to project out another 10 years into the future and look at the 30 year mark. So assuming you started at age 30, this would now put you at the age of 60. And even if you started at 35, you would still be 65 at this point within the window of where people begin to think about retirement in most cases. Well, this is pretty crazy here because you would now be looking at $1.4 million over that 30 year time frame. And in terms of your total contributions, you've contributed 180,000 and you've made over 1.2 million in capital gains from the stock market. This is definitely exciting stuff here, but you have to also consider taxes associated with any investment out there. That's why later on we're going to talk about an account called the Roth IRA, which you may want to be aware of in order to shelter yourself from a significant tax bill. Like we said, this is $1.2 million roughly of capital gains. And if you had to pay 20% tax on that, which is the upper end of long-term capital gains, you'd be talking about a quarter million dollars in terms of a tax bill without even considering the possibility of state taxes. So if you don't want to pay a mountain in taxes, stay tuned for that Roth IRA discussion at the end. Now that we understand the wealth building power of investing in the stock market for the long term, let's talk about how to actually do this in a practical manner. What we're looking at here is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, and this is a type of mutual fund, but instead of having active stock pickers and fund managers who are changing allocations all of the time, you have a passive management approach where instead of trying to beat the market, the fund managers simply try to replicate the market as closely as possible. Now, this is not the preferred method for investing in index funds these days because the minimum investment here is 3,000 and the expense ratio is a little bit higher than what I'm going to show you now, which is the exchange traded fund. But all that means is you take a fund like this, break it up into individual shares, and then allow those shares to trade on the major exchanges. That way you can buy shares of a fund just like you buy shares of a stock. If we click here on the ETF, this brings us over to VOO, which is one of the most popular ways to get diversified exposure to the S&P 500. The expense ratio is lower, coming in at 0.03%, and the share price is a little over $400, but most brokerages today allow you to buy fractional shares, meaning that in many cases you can invest as little as one single dollar into VOO, and then having that dollar diversified across the entire S&P 500. 
If we scroll down here, we get more information about the fund. I do want to show you, as we talked about earlier, the sectors and industries. You can get an overview here of the composition of VOO, and this shows you the percentage of your money that goes into these different sectors. 28% of your money goes right into information technology. This is because companies like Apple and Microsoft, etc., have become so dominant in today's economy. After that, 13.1% of your money goes into healthcare, and then financials is the next biggest category, followed by consumer discretionary. And then we have the individual holdings of the fund. This is very interesting because we have a top heavy market. The leading companies are the biggest companies, and because it's a market value weighted index, the majority of your money goes there. So of that $1 that you would invest potentially into the OO, 7.5% of it goes directly into Apple stock. And then second to that, around 6.5% goes into Microsoft. So if you invest in the S&P 500, 14% of your money goes right into Apple and Microsoft stock. After that, Amazon is the next biggest slice at roughly 3%. NVIDIA is about that same size. Now, Google, there's two classes of shares. There's the class A and the class C. And if you combine them, you're looking at about three and three quarter percent going into Google. You also have Tesla, Facebook, or now Meta, and then Berkshire Hathaway, as well as United Health Group being the biggest holdings. What we're looking at here is a chart of the S&P 500 over the last year. And it's important to follow a strategy known as dollar cost averaging when you're investing for the long haul. That's because if you dump all of your money into the market at once, you risk overpaying for that asset. And if that's the case, you could then be down on your investment for a long period of time. Let's say, for example, if we look at the last two years here of the S&P 500, we can see that back in December, it hit about 47.66. And here we are at 44.16 today. We did climb back up here to a high of 45.82, but we still have not cracked that figure from back in December. If you were somebody who unfortunately put all of your money into the market at the end of 2021, well, then you would still be down on that investment. So instead of dumping your money in, you want to dollar cost average. And that just means funneling your money into the market at a routine interval, and then ideally investing the same amount of money each time. We talked about investing $500 a month into the S&P 500, and you could accomplish that with VOO very easily, and then just making a monthly contribution through either your brokerage account or potentially Roth IRA account. Now, speaking of the Roth IRA account, I do want to segue into that as this is very important to think about, especially in your 30s. You might not be thinking about your retirement accounts if you're investing in your 20s, but in your 30s, it's really time to start thinking about that. If you do work a job, you may have this opportunity to invest in a 401k. Most people are familiar with that, and there may in some cases be a match that your employer offers. Those are generally good things to pursue. But the difference between a 401k and a Roth IRA is when you experience the benefit. With the 401k, the benefit's at the front end because you get a tax deduction and you're able to lower your taxable income through making contributions. However, you're also letting your money grow for decades and decades and then paying taxes at the end on this gigantic sum of money that's grown over time. The benefit to the Roth IRA is at the end. You take your post-tax dollars and you tuck it into the Roth, and then if you follow the basic requirements, your earnings can be completely tax-free as well as dividends earned during that time. The main stipulations to be aware of is that you cannot touch the earnings in the account until the age of 59 and a half or older, and you need to have owned the account for five years or more before you touch those earnings. Let's say you started this at 30 and then you wanted to tap into it at 60, you could definitely do that with the Roth IRA and then shelter yourself from all of those taxes. 
There are a few things to be aware of in terms of contribution limits. Um, for 2023, that's going to be $6,500 for most people or $7,500 if you're age 50 or older. And we were talking about $500 a month or $6,000 per year with the example from earlier. So if you wanted to, you could easily accomplish that within the Roth IRA. And if you want to open up a retirement account or brokerage account, I'm not affiliated or endorsed by Vanguard, but they are a very popular option. You can scroll up here and click on the Get Started button, and this starts the account wizard. If we click up here on Open a New Account with Money from My Bank, and then we click on Continue, we are now at the screen here where we choose between Vanguard Advice Services or doing things on our own. We're going to select Invest on My Own. And then if you have a login for Vanguard, which you might from your 401k, for example, you can enter that here or you can click on Sign Up if you're new to Vanguard. If we click on Select Your Account, you have Retirement Investing, General Investing, and then you have Education or General Investing for a Minor, and then Small Business or SEP IRA. The top three may be of interest to you. The first one being retirement investing. This is where you can open up that Roth IRA if you want to take advantage of that type of account and avoid paying taxes on your long-term investments. We're also gonna click on general investing because if you're looking to just invest in a traditional brokerage account or potentially invest with your spouse, you can do that with an individual or joint brokerage account. And one other thing that you might be considering in your 30s if you have kids is starting a 529 plan or something along those lines for college savings. And you also have the option of setting up a UGMA or UTMA account, which is an investing account for a minor, if you wanted to begin setting your kids up for decades and decades of compounding, you can accomplish all of that right here within Vanguard. Now, when you're investing, you have to figure out something called your asset allocation, and this is the percentage of money that you're putting in different buckets. When you're younger, this may not matter as much because you have years and years ahead, meaning you can take on more risk. But by the time you're in your 30s, you really need to start taking this seriously. And what that means is putting a set percentage of your money in equities or stocks and then having a set percentage in fixed income or bonds, for example. Now, there's a couple of rules of thumb that I want to share with you, and over here we're looking at Bogleheads.org. This is a resource named after John Bogle, who is the individual who pioneered the index fund, which is the very reason we're able to invest in this low-fee diversified manner to begin with. And I just did a full video on the Vanguard index funds. I'll put a card in the corner if you want to check that out later. This right here shows you the returns from 2000 to 2002 of these different portfolios portfolios. And as you can see here, when you ramp up your bond allocation, you're having less and less of an impact from the markets. Looking at this 80-20 portfolio, that had a 34.35% drop, whereas just dropping to a 60-40 means you only experienced around a 20% drop with that portfolio. Now, you're not going to have as much upside in terms of your gains when the markets are doing well, but you don't want to have all of that potential downside as you get older and get closer to retirement. As far as the rule of thumb, John Bogle himself recommends roughly your age in bonds. As a 30-year-old, then you might put 30% of your money in bonds, and then at 40, you might put 40% in bonds. However, in this day and age, that might be a little bit too conservative as a lot of people are living much longer than previously. So as a result of that, a newer rule of thumb that many people follow is taking 120, subtracting your age, and that being the percentage of your money that you allocate into stocks or equities. Let's say you're 35, for example. The John Bogle approach would tell you that 35% of your money should go into bonds or fixed income. Whereas the 120 rule would tell you that 85% of your money should go into equities and 15% should go into bonds. If you want to get super dialed in on this, I would recommend consulting with a financial advisor. And you can also talk to a fee-only financial advisor if you just want recommendations on setting up portfolio allocations. But these are some general guidelines to consider.
And once you determine your allocation, you do need to rebalance your portfolio over time because these allocations are going to change based on the performance of the stock market as well as the bond market. This visual here gives a good example of this. You can see where this portfolio started off 60% in equities, 40% in fixed income. And then if you give that portfolio time when the market is going up, it'll end up like this where 65% or more could be in equities and now you have 35% in fixed income. This is a more aggressive portfolio. And if you wanted to rebalance, you would sell off a little slice of the equities and put that into the bonds instead, getting back to that 60-40. And if you don't wanna worry about asset allocation and rebalancing all of that, take a look here at these Vanguard Target Retirement Funds. These have all of that built right in. All you have to do is scroll down and based on either your birth year or your target retirement date, you can find a fund that has automatic rebalancing and reallocating based on your target retirement year. Let's say, for example, you were born in 1980. That would put you in this category here. You have about 25 more years for retirement. That's the target retirement 2045 fund. And you can click on this right here to get more information. Now these do have a little bit higher of fees and minimums. The minimum investment here is 1,000 with a 0.08% fee. However, this does have the benefits there of not having to worry about the reallocating and rebalancing as it does it automatically and then changes the risk of that portfolio as you get closer to retirement. But anyways, guys, that's a wrap here on investing in your 30s. I hope this gave you a good guideline in terms of the steps you may want to follow and also whether or not you're on track for a happy retirement based on where you're at right now financially. If you are looking to accelerate your earnings potential, I do have a book from side hustle to main hustle to millionaire. And this book is all about my side hustle journey in terms of how I was able to build up these various digital income streams. So if you're curious about that realm and potentially looking to start a side hustle to allow you to invest faster, potentially retiring early, I would definitely recommend checking out that resource. You can grab a copy of my book at libraries across the United States. It's also in person at most Barnes and Noble stores. You'll also find it on Amazon and an author narrated version on Audible. If you want to learn more about investing in the stock market, I just did a full one hour crash course, which I will put in the corner or linked up down in the description below, or you can click below to start watching that now. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell and turn on all notifications, and I hope to see you over there.